relish will not be abandoned to the back of your fridge or only used for hamburgers and hot dogs. Oh no, you're gonna wanna use this for so much more. Oh, you have doubts? Let me give you some meal ideas first and then we'll jump right into making and preserving your own beautiful jars of relish. You've gotta try making bacon relish and cream cheese croissant pinwheels this weekend. With just four ingredients and a pan, you can create the perfect breakfast or brunch treat in minutes. After rolling out your dough, spread cream cheese on top, then ladle with relish. Add cooked bacon and tightly roll before thinly slicing with a sharp knife and adding to a baking dish to bake in a warm oven for 20 minutes. These are good and simple and your only problem will be that you didn't make enough. Take a minute to grab your cup of coffee, then pop your bacon relish pinwheels out of the oven. Place your dish in the center of the table for your family or guests to pull apart and enjoy the savory combination of bright and bold bits of relish in warm cream cheese and savory undertones of bacon. Now let's move on to lunch. If you enjoy the taste of a classic chicken sandwich, but you haven't tried zucchini relish as the leading condiment on that sandwich, what are you waiting for? <laughs> This is a go-to recipe my family and I rave about, and you've gotta try. Better yet, it cooks up quick. Start by dipping chicken breasts in a panko bread batter and fry until done. Then lightly sear your bun with butter. Spread mayonnaise on the bottom slice, followed by an arugula salad blend to add a bit of natural spiciness. And add your beautifully bronzed and crispy chicken breast and top with a spoon or two of zucchini relish to impart all the complimentary flavors of sweet and tangy in a moist jam-like spread that'll make your taste buds sing. When you go for your first bite, you'll quite simply fall in love with how the pre-buttered bun, relish, and fried chicken both combine and contrast to make this umami flavor even more stimulating. You and I both know you need that sandwich in your life. And you could easily replace the chicken on that sandwich with uh, pork or bacon or roast beef and it would be just as delicious. That's because zucchini relish is the not so secret condiment that improves any meat, any time. Now let's talk side dishes, salads, and entrees. Because let's be honest, sometimes things like baked beans, doubled eggs, potato salad, and tuna salad have a tendency to become a little bit uninspired and honestly a bit bland. Let this zucchini relish help you out. Adding relish is almost always the answer to amp up the flavor of almost any cooked salad or side that needs a little oomph. I love taking boring baked beans, adding chopped bacon with a few drizzles of maple syrup, and sneaking this all-purpose zucchini relish in to create my own country maple and bacon baked beans. And zucchini relish is just as handy at dinner time, especially when soup, casserole, or pasta is on the menu. Pasta is a mainstay dish in our home, and one of my favorite ways to put a spin on my sauce is to add this relish. The cucumbers, onion, red and yellow green peppers in this dish, along with zucchini, is a natural pairing to any tomato or cheese-based sauce. Now keep in mind, these are just a few of the ways you'll use your zucchini relish. It's also great baked on top of salmon and chicken, stirred into batter to make savory muffins, 
or mixed with yogurt or cream cheese to make dips. If this is our first time meeting, hi, I'm Cassandra from the blog becomingafarmgirl.com and I absolutely love sharing candy recipes for modern meals and ways to live a farm fresh life without land or livestock. So now it's time to dive into the recipe, but don't worry about writing anything down. I have the link to the printable recipe below. But if you're a returning canning friend that enjoys my canning recipes, you can automatically receive every recipe in your inbox every time I upload a video. Now it is strictly the recipe where I go a little bit into depth about things. It's not a newsletter. And if you've already signed up, then you've already got the full blog post and the video and the pictures and the recipe tips already in your inbox. Now I am going to meet you back here in a couple of minutes so that we can talk about canning safety, recipe tips, and a few of my recommendations. Now let's get started. I like to begin any canning project by sanitizing my equipment and I especially enjoy the ease of this canning lid rack which is a quick and easy way to sterilize my canning lids and rings. It holds up to 12 regular or wide mouth canning lids and rings and once placed in boiling water, I add this and my jars and it's so easy to see the water circulate. I love how the handy knob grip keeps my hand away from the boiling water and steam and while modern lids do not require this step, I attribute my very high seal rate to this process so if you think you'd like to add this to your canning prep routine, the link to order is below. Start by finely chopping the zucchini, onion, pepper, and celery. Since this is a small batch, I'm doing all of the chopping by hand using a quality sharp knife, but feel free to use the pulse or chop option on a food processor or blender if you want to speed things up. I'm one of those types that oddly enough finds chopping very therapeutic, so I don't mind the extra 7 to 10 minutes that it takes. You'll want to grab a large non-reactive mixing bowl to place your ingredients in after they're diced. Now I just go ahead and use the pan that I'm going to cook things in. It's just less mess. As you're removing the skins and ends from the veggies, don't forget to keep a scrap bowl so that you can freeze them now to use to make homemade stock later. I'm pivoting back to my pot on the stove to remove my now sterilized jars, lids, and rings to air dry as I finish preparing the relish. Let me take a moment to share that before this recipe, I was never a relish fan. In fact, I reluctantly decided to make relish because, well, I have OCD, obsessive canning disorder, and figured that I could make a practical debut at a neighborhood picnic party and not waste a basket of zucchini my neighbor unexpectedly shared with me. And that turned out to be the best decision because nationally produced commercial brands of almost anything are at best a second class imposter to the original. And it's just another reason why making and canning your own condiments always yields unbeatable flavor variations you didn't even know you were missing. After sprinkling in some salt, cover your mixed ingredients with cold water until everything is fully submerged, place a lid on top, and allow this to sit for at least one hour and up to six. Rinse and drain the zucchini mixture twice using a colander the first time and with cheesecloth on the second. Now if you don't have cheesecloth on hand like I didn't hear, don't worry, you can improvise like I did by covering your ingredients with wax paper and placing a heavy object like a mortar and pestle on top for a few minutes. You just want to use a mechanism that helps you to press out the excess moisture. Once you've done that, set things aside. In a large heavy bottom pot, add sugar, vinegar, dry mustard powder, celery seed, mustard seed, and pickling spices secured in an herb strainer or use an unbleached tea disposable bag like I do. You want to bring your ingredients to a boil over high heat and then you'll reduce the heat to medium low and simmer for five minutes. After this, you'll add your zucchini mixture and return to a boil. Ah yes, be sure to add a pinch of cloves, relish isn't the same without it. Reduce the heat to a gentle uncovered simmer for at least 45 minutes or until the mixture is thickened. While our relish is simmering on the stove, I wanted to jump back in and share my recipe recommendations because while it's important that canning is delicious, even more so, we want it to be safe. All the recipes that I share here and over on the blog are sourced from preservation authorities, which include the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and companies like Ball and Bernardin. The recipe that I'm sharing with you today is from one of my favorite canning recipe books 
that I've shared many times. The Complete Book of Small Batch Preserving, over 300 delicious recipes to use year-round by Ellie Topp and Margaret Howard. This cookbook has been a bestseller in food preservation for decades. If you're a small batch canner that doesn't preserve more than six to 10 jars at a time, and you're looking to can beyond single ingredients, you're going to get recipes ranging from sauces to spreads to chutneys. Now the downside is that it doesn't come with pictures, but each of the recipes has a description at the very top that is so detailed and will make your mouth water. I've included the link to where you can find this book and other reviews on Amazon in the description box below. All right, friends, so now I'm just gonna look down at some of my notes. Now the first tip is that bigger zucchini isn't better. You really wanna look for our small but firm, blemish-free and vibrant green zucchini. Zucchini really starts to get bitter as it gets larger, so stay away from any overly large squash. And don't use any zucchini that's overly ripe or badly blemished or is starting to mold. Oh, this is funny. So for tip number two, I'm calling it all about looks. And what I mean by that is that I do tend to use a bit of a color code, especially if I plan to give a few jars away. Now y'all, this does not apply to everything, but I am that kind of canner that does enjoy the visual appeal of a pretty can on my shelf. So while you can use just standard green peppers, please add yellow and red if you have them. And leaving the skin on your zucchinis doesn't affect the texture or the flavor, so I actually prefer to leave the skin on just so I get the contrast between the light and emerald green colors in the jar. Oh, gorgeous. Okay, for this next tip, we're gonna talk brine basics. So the great thing about this recipe is that you actually have a number of vinegars that are at your disposal. Okay, so here are my notes about this. While distilled white vinegar is most commonly used because it has a mellow flavor and retains the color of your product, you might wanna consider going half distilled and half apple cider vinegar for something that gives you a little bit more of a distinct flavor. Now I have made this recipe several times and the way that I enjoy it the most is using rice wine vinegar. And I prefer that because it adds a mild, sweet, and crisp kind of taste to it that, oh, it's just, I love it. That's my preference. But remember this, regardless of the vinegar or vinegars you use, you must ensure that the acidity is at least 5% or higher to ensure that your relish is safely preserved. Simply put, you don't wanna use your homemade stuff. All right, so here's another tip that's also pretty easy to forget. And I'm calling this tip, don't rush relish. Why? Because it's actually meant to get better with age. Yeah, so did you know that vinegar is actually best eaten at least a week later when the flavors have had time to meld and the vinegar and mellows out a tad? Now, can you enjoy this immediately? Totally, I've done it. But if you truly wanna know what you're working with, give your relish some time. Friends, if you have any tips or recipe recommendations, please be sure to leave them in the comment section below. I do enjoy reading them as others do, and I also update my blog with your feedback. All right, friends, that's all I've got. Remember that full directions with details are on the blog and also refer to a primary source like a canning recipe book. Let's hop back to the stove. Your relish is ready when things are tender, fragrant, and your brine has darkened and thickened. You'll also want to sneak in a taste test just to be certain. Ladle hot relish into sterile jars, leaving a quarter inch of headspace. Approved candy recipes limit the size of your jar to half pints or pints, so stick with these sizes. Remove air bubbles using a debubbler stick or plastic or wooden skewer around the perimeter of your jars. Then wipe the rims of the jars clean with distilled vinegar to remove any drops of sticky residue that may prevent your lids from sealing. Place your lids on top and secure with a canning ring until the fit is fingertip tight. Process the half pint or pint jars in a boiling water bath for 10 minutes. Use a tall stock pot lined with a canning rack to prevent your jars from touching the pot surface and cracking. Add enough water so that at least one inch of boiling water will be over the tops of your jars during processing. You can confirm the jars have sealed by removing the rings. A sealed jar lid will remain secure to the jar without the rim and be slightly indented in the center. Use your index finger to moderately tap on the jar in a few places. It shouldn't pop back up when pressed. The majority of your jars will seal within a few hours of cooling down. If you have any jars that didn't seal properly, just store them in the fridge and use them within the month. To get more canning recipes, join me here weekly or over on the blog. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon.